There's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Calvin's sitting on a on a sled top of the hill. And he's thinking, go ahead, go down the hill. You won't run into that boulder. You won't run into that that stream. It's not too steep. In the last panel he says, My brain is trying to kill me. And that's one of the main problems in life is your mind is trying to kill you. If not kill you physically, kill your goodness, kill your possibility of really getting anywhere in the practice. John Mahabua talks about how when he was a young monk, he was afraid to go out and practice for fear that it would be wasted energy. There was a belief in that time. The time for jhana had passed, the time for nirvana had passed, and he was afraid that it would have been a lot of wasted effort. And he got over the fear by realizing that whatever the Buddha taught was not meant to be an executioner of your happiness. Whatever is required of the path, whether it's easy, whether it's difficult, it's all good. And it's not that progress happens only when it's easy or when the, only when you're enjoying it. This is Sutta where he talks about how some things are good in the present, good in the future, good in the present, bad in the future, bad in the present, good in the future, bad in the present, and bad in the future. And the one that's bad in the present but good in the future, he says, is the person who's practicing the Dharma, leading the holy life, thoroughly miserable tears running down his cheeks or her cheeks, but you're willing to stick with it. In cases like that, the mind has lots of ways of pulling you away, and you have to watch out for them. Learn how to catch the mind when it's lying to you. Sometimes it comes as psychotherapy. Say, well, this is bad for you, it's unhealthy, and all the jargon that therapists have cooked up to keep people from exerting themselves, to keep them happy with a, a life which really is really not worth being happy with. Like the therapist I was talking to up in Vancouver last year, he was working in a storefront that offers psychological counseling to drug addicts. He was saying for years they had trouble just getting people to come in off the street for free therapy. And they found the one approach that worked to at least pull the people into the storefront was to help them work on their self-esteem. But the problem was they ended up with people who had high self-esteem and they're still on drugs. They're perfectly okay now with having drugs. They didn't feel bad about themselves for taking drugs. He was beginning to realize that this was not an advance. This was a, actually a setback. But there was a lot of that in psychotherapy. Therapists will tell you that there are a lot of people who are afraid they're going to lose their clients, so they tell the clients whatever they think the clients want to hear. And because it's a science, begins to sound scientific. So we have to watch out for that. People even use the Dharma as a way of lying to themselves. They use the wrong Dharma at the wrong time. There's a classic case of that in the novel. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph has been working as a slave in charge of Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife has been trying to seduce him for an entire novel. And you think he's been able to steer clear of it, but then one day the whole family goes out. Some holiday requires everybody goes over to the west side of the river for ceremonies at the tombs, and they're going to come back and it's going to be a big dinner. And Potiphar's wife lets it be known that she's not feeling well. She's going to stay home alone in the house. 
And Joseph goes over with the group to the west side of the river, and then he starts telling himself, gee, you know, as a responsible steward here, I really ought to go back and check the arrangements back at the house. And there's this long series of little maxims that he repeats to himself to convince him that that's his duty to go back. So as a fool, he ends up going back. And she attacks him physically. He's able to get away, but she has his cloak. It's because of that that he has to go into prison. She accuses him of having tried to rape her, all out of a sense of duty. So you have to watch out for that voice in the mind that says, well, you'd really be better off. You've got this duty, you've got that duty. But is it genuinely, genuinely your duty? That's one of the most seductive ways the mind has of lying to itself. So this is why when you meditate, you have to learn how to say no to every thought that comes up. It's your first line of defense. That means not just putting it aside, but questioning it. Is that really true? Is that so? Is that so? You could ask. And then watch. Try to keep the mind in position with the breath, or just with the sense of the body in the present moment. Staying outside of your thought worlds. And remembering the old principle, don't believe everything you think. Because it's very rarely that we fall for just raw desire. Desires have their reasons. This is an old problem in ancient philosophy. Some philosophers said there's reason and then there's desire, and they're two totally separate functions of the mind. But then other philosophers notice that, well, if, if you can reason with your desires, or reason can win out over desires, it's not winning out just through force. If desires actually listen to reason, it means they have reasons of their own. And oftentimes they won't tell you what their real reasons are. They have other reasons. They're like politicians. They wave a flag over here so they can do their dirty work over there. And if you really love yourself, really care for yourself, really want to put an end to suffering, you have to learn to look for this, to recognize the red herrings, the distractions, the good-seeming reasons that are actually going to lead you astray. Often they're in terms of abstractions. This is one way you can recognize them. The Buddha didn't deal with abstractions. He dealt with actions, specific actions. This action, what is it going to lead to? That action, what is it going to lead to? Where does it tend? And the more you get pulled off into abstractions, the further and further you get away from the actual action and seeing what the connection is between the action and the result. This is why a lot of meditation is staying under the radar. The abstractions are flying through the air, but you stay down close to the ground. Just watch. When I think in this way, what's the tone in the body? What's the tone in the mind? Where is this leading? Which of my defilements wants me to believe this? It's like that old way of protecting yourself when you're reading magazines or newspapers. Somebody wants me to believe this. Why? So you don't get entirely pulled in by an argument. This is one of the important gifts of the practice, is that it gives you a place here with the breath to step back and watch your thought worlds. 
in terms of cause and effect. I mean, this is how the Buddha said he got onto the path. After realizing that jhana was one of the factors of the path, then he had to work on right resolve, i.e. training his mind to see what kind of thoughts lead toward concentration, what kind of thoughts lead away from concentration, that lead to stillness or away from stillness. Now you look at the thoughts in terms of cause and effect, and to what extent are they bringing the mind to a sense of well-being, ease. Sometimes the path to that ease is going to be hard. The Buddha never said it's going to be easy all along the way. But you have to look in terms of the long-term results of what you're doing. So the concentration, as you're working on it, is basically developing a set of skills so you can gauge what's being said in the mind, so you can figure out who's lying to you, who's telling the truth. who has your best interests in mind, and who doesn't. That image of a John Lee saying that there's all kinds of beings in your bloodstream. A thought goes through your brain, well maybe it's one of those little beings go through the bloodstream around your brain. So you don't have to identify with everything that comes up in the mind or gets lodged as an emotion. been reading about the Romantics and the Transcendentalists, how they really had a strong respect for your intuitions, you know, gave an absolute authority to your intuitions. That's dangerous. You can't give absolute authority to anything. You have to test everything, and in the testing develop the ability to judge more and more reliably. This is why we take refuge in the Buddha to begin with. We need someone as an example. Someone we can compare our thoughts to, our actions to, our words to, until we reach the point where we really can depend on ourselves. So if anything's pulling you away from the practice, remember it's lying to you. And it's not going to present itself simply as raw desire. It's going to have its reasons, and some of them sound very, very smooth and convincing. And it's one of the skills you have to develop as a meditator to so learn how to see through that. I think I've mentioned before one of the traits of about a John Fung that really struck me when I first met him was how skeptical he was. He wasn't willing to jump to conclusions, either believing or not believing. He'd watch. He'd watch some more, and he'd watch some more. And that's how you can prevent even your, your insights from getting hijacked by your defilements. An insight comes in, and pride can arise around it. Which is why Gyananda Yon is always saying that whenever an insight comes, watch to see what happens next, and what happens next, what happens next. And John Lee's test would be, well, you get an insight, well, what if the opposite is true? To what extent is what you just learned true? To what extent is its opposite true? It's this ability to step back and watch that's so important. So ultimately you can't see through to the truth. 